we're here, and we're ready to praise and worship our Lord and Savior. What better way? It's the morning, so it's time to rise. It's time to rise up and praise the name of Jesus Christ. So please join us in singing. Rise up. Thank you. 
Hey, Pastor, thanks for seeing me. This is so great. I have been wanting to talk to you for quite a while, and um, to be right here with you right now is awesome. Does it look like I have an appointment? Being the children's minister, uh, first the good news, because who doesn't like good news? <laughs> Listen, I've been looking at the numbers, and we are hurting, all right? We are bleeding with a capital B, okay? I know you've been wanting to talk to me, but being the youth minister, I'm really busy, okay? I'm doing a lot, a lot of stuff. But as building superintendent of this here church, I got a problem. Singles ministry, it ain't working. No one's coming. You know it, and I know it. There's only one thing I think this church is missing. Snakes. I just really need to confess to you, my pastor, that the Ten Commandments, I've done all of them. Okay, I've committed all of them, okay? Except murder. I am the chairman of the deacons of this church. This weekend we're doing a junior high lock-in. That is a great concept, isn't it? I mean, whoever thought of that, I mean, you know what I'm saying? What if we rent out the left side of our auditorium to that new hipster church, huh? Here's my letter of resignation. I'm going back to work at Starbucks because they give benefits. The good news is with VBS, um, we had so many kids involved and 17 kids came to know the Lord. Yay. I was here long before you got here. Um, the bad news is we've lost one of them, um, Timmy. And I'll be here long after you're gone. I need you to have my back, okay? I need you to have my back because, I mean, the seniors, they are, they are on me. Not my senior high class, but the senior citizens, they do not like me. We're not using it. You're not going to fill it up with your messages. And here's the simple truth. That could help us out. What do you say? Hip, 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 stir away? Get a hold of yourself. Just get a hold of yourself. How about we let Carl here loose on some of our congregants? See who's without sin and who's not, huh? I'm sure this happens a lot in churches, doesn't it? No. Okay. Okay. No. And by the way, I can't get that smell out of the van. So just have my back, okay? I'm really, really trying. I got a lot on my plate. Do, do you see that? God has been talking to me really big time. And I think he wants me to preach. Adios, muchacho. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Carl, oh, Carl's out. Carl's out. No hard feelings? Don't mind if I do. Thank you, sir. Is that cigarette? You need to get right with the Lord or get out of here because that snake's poisonous. I'm not kidding. Carl! <laughs>So I want to start off with a story about a pastor by the name of Jeremiah Stepik. Now, Pastor Stepik was hired to be the pastor of a very large church, about a 10,000 member church. And before his first Sunday, uh, he wanted to try something with his new congregation because they hadn't had a chance, other than the elders of the church, they hadn't had a chance to meet him yet. So he disguised himself as a homeless person. And he walked into the church for worship about a half hour before worship started. So he would see people as they were coming in. And what happened was, is he tried to greet people. And of the thousands of people that were in there, only three people actually greeted him as he came in to the church. He had asked a few people for change to buy food. Not a single person in that entire church gave him any change to buy food with. So he walks into the sanctuary for worship and he goes to the very front of the sanctuary and he is greeted by the ushers who tell him he is not allowed to sit there, that he has to sit way in the back. So as he's going back to his seat, he's being given dirty looks. People are just kind of scowling at him. He's trying to be friendly and greet people, but nobody was being responsive. As worship started, the elders of the church who knew what the pastor was doing uh, said that they want to introduce their new pastor. So they got up and they said, ladies and gentlemen, we'd like to introduce Pastor Jeremiah Stepik. So people start clapping and, you know, uh, applauding for him and looking around to try and see what he looks like. And all of a sudden, this homeless man starts to walk to the front of the church. And as he's walking to the front of the church, people are no longer clapping. They're, they're kind of looking at him with a strange look. They're not sure what's going on. So Pastor Stepik goes on 
to the microphone and he recites the following. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come you who are blessed by my father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. After he recited this, he looks towards the congregation and told them, everything he'd experienced that morning. Many began to cry, and many bowed their heads in shame, and finally he said, Today, I see a gathering of people, not a church of Jesus Christ. The world has enough people, but not enough disciples. When will you decide to become disciples? He then dismissed service until the following week. So, how do you think the people would have treated him had they known who he was? Or even if they didn't know who he was, but if he came into church and he was well-dressed, or he drove up in a very nice car, they saw that he put a very nice sum of cash in the offering plate, he probably would have been treated a lot better. Another thing I like to think about with this passage is how many people never came back to that church because the pastor called them out for the behavior. So as we are continuing this week, we are continuing on our journey through the book of James. And this is something that James was concerned about. And what I mean is he was concerned about the presence of favoritism in the church. More specifically, he was worried about those who were wealthy in the church being given preferential treatment at the expense of the poor in the church. Now, when Jesus came to this world, it was to be an advocate for the poor. In Jesus' day, poverty was a situation you couldn't easily get yourself out of because the rich actively sought to oppress the poor and keep them in that state. If you were poor, your children would be poor, and their children would be poor, and the cycle of poverty could not be broken. So when Jesus came, he did so as a way to give hope to the poor. Because hope was something that these people were sorely lacking. So as Jesus grew his ministry, the majority of his followers were the poor that he encountered along the way. But after his ascension, as the church started to grow during the time of James, this message of Jesus is starting to appeal not just to the poor, but to the wealthy as well. Just like today, the work of ministry needs funding, it needs money. So when these wealthier people started to become followers of Christ, James was worried that the church leaders might be tempted to cater to them more, to, to show them more favor, and to, at the same time, dismiss the needs of the poor. So in this passage, in today's lesson from James, we hear James's concern about this, and it comes to us from the book of James, chapter 2, verses 1 to 13, the Common English Translation. My brothers and sisters, when you show favoritism, you deny the faithfulness of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been resurrected in glory. Imagine two people coming into your meeting. One has a gold ring and fine clothes, while the other is poor, dressed in filthy rags. Then suppose that you were to take special notice of the one wearing fine clothes, saying, Here's an excellent place, sit here. But to the poor person you say, Stand over there, or Here, sit at my feet. Wouldn't you have shown favoritism among yourselves and become evil-minded judges? My dear brothers and sisters, listen. Hasn't God chosen those who are poor by worldly standards to be rich in terms of faith? Hasn't God chosen the poor as heirs of the kingdom he has promised to those who love him? But you have dishonored the poor. Don't the wealthy make life difficult for you? Aren't they the ones who drag you into court? Aren't they the ones who insult the good names spoken over you at your baptism? You do well when you really fulfill the royal law found in Scripture. Love your neighbor as yourself. 
But when you show favoritism, you are committing a sin. And by that same law, you are exposed as a lawbreaker. Anyone who tries to keep all of the law but fails at one point is guilty of failing to keep all of it. The one who said, don't commit adultery, also said, don't commit murder. So if you don't commit adultery but do commit murder, you are a lawbreaker. In every way, then, speak and act as people who will be judged by the law of freedom. There will be no mercy and judgment for anyone who hasn't shown mercy. Mercy overrules judgment. The word of God. It's funny with how much the church has changed and everything that's happened in the church of Jesus over the last 2,000 years, that this reality that James was worried about has remained a constant during that entire time. As we saw in the story of Pastor Stepik and his church, James's concern has been realized in the church today. True equality is almost impossible to achieve. It's impossible to treat everyone equally. Um, but what James is warning about is the willfully showing of favoritism to a person and actively oppressing another. James didn't want the oppression that was happening outside the church, where the poor were being held down by the wealthy and abused by the wealthy. He didn't want that behavior and that culture to infiltrate the church. And over the years, the church would have this issue of favoritism infested in it like a disease. And it's something that can destroy a church from within. In fact, our belief system, Methodism, was founded in response to this very issue. John Wesley, our founder, he founded the Methodist movement as a response to the Church of England's negligence of the poor. He and his fellow Methodists would preach in the streets and in the fields to the people who felt unwelcome in the church. When Methodism was came to America, it caught on and it grew. And in the colonial days, it became the fastest growing form of Christianity in the nation. And it would be that way for years. But over time, the preaching went from being in the streets and the tents and the fields to large buildings, cathedrals, sanctuaries. The church grew so much that bigger and bigger sanctuaries started being built with taller and taller steeples. To build those large cathedrals, what do you need? Money. Those with money were more than happy to give it, as long as it was something in it for them. You know, while formal dress codes may not have existed for the church, it was an unspoken rule that you would wear your Sunday best to church, which is a way of showing off how much money you had. Churches starting enacting things like pew taxes, or those who could afford to would pay to have the same seat in worship every week. Those that put the most money in the plate were given leadership positions in the church. The church was growing in political influence, and those in power saw the church as another place to wield power and to have political influence. The church in America was becoming less about God and more about status. With all that being said, if you're somebody who maybe doesn't have the nicest clothes, or who doesn't have a lot of money, or doesn't live in a very nice place, or is possibly even homeless, would you feel comfortable going to a church like this? Probably not. And in most cases, someone like that would not be welcome into these churches. Which is sad because the poor are the ones that Jesus' message was meant for because they needed it the most. The poor are the ones who would be the most willing to put their full trust in God and rely on him, whereas the wealthy have reduced the church to being an extracurricular activity. Nowadays, the prominence of the church in our country has drastically declined. In 1937, Gallup, which is a polling firm, started tracking church attendance as a percentage of the U.S. population. In 1937, 73% of the U.S. population attended or was affiliated with a church. In the late 1940s, it reached its peak at 76%. And as recently as the late 1990s, early 2000s, that number was still around 70%. Today, we're at 47%. Now, there are many fag factors that contribute to this, ranging from the growth of other religions uh, the secularization of our society where worship is not seen as a priority anymore. And in fact, it's 
treated like an extracurricular activity. It's, it takes lesser priority than things like kids sports where coaches and schools don't really respect the sanctity of Sunday morning as being a time for worship and will schedule games and practices. Yeah. It can be that the church doesn't have a lot of relatability to our modern lives, that the church is too stuck in its traditions and isn't relating to people and meeting their needs. Regardless of the reasons, it, it isn't as personally beneficial for someone, at least for someone with bad intentions, to be a part of the church anymore. It doesn't carry the same political weight that it used to. It didn't can't come as with the same status. It doesn't come with the same status as it used to. James knew that in his day that many of these followers that were wealthy were probably fickle and would only be a part of the church as long as it was beneficial to them. So in our modern time, we are left with these crumbling buildings, high utility bills, mortgages, outrageous insurance bills, and other costs that are passed down to us by the good old days of the church. And that is hampering the church's ability today to do real ministry to the poor. This is why Jesus preached in people's homes and at the sides of a mountain or at a dinner table or on the beach. Because those places don't have mortgages. Those places don't need to be repaired. Those places don't have tax bills and utility bills. These tall, crumbling buildings were built supposedly for the glory of God, but the thing is, God never asked for them. They were built out of ego and the belief that the good old days of the church would never end. So as different denominations built bigger and bigger buildings to try and outdo the other ones in town, now we're left with all these crumbling buildings that are just a burden. The reason Jesus ministered to the poor is because he knew they were the ones that he could count on. They were the ones that would be willing to give everything they had to God and put their full trust in him. When those who only served God as a means to serve their own egos, as they fell by the wayside, James knew it would be those left behind that would truly represent God's kingdom. But how many of those poor, the ones that Jesus sought out, would even feel comfortable coming to worship today? Not many, because they probably still have that belief that they would not be welcomed. And again, the sad truth is, in many churches, they wouldn't be. James worried that soon the poor of his time would feel the same way that they wouldn't feel welcome. And with that, the true mission of the Church of Jesus Christ would be lost. So he was trying to reason with his followers that, look, you're, you're putting up these wealthy people on pedestals. These are the same wealthy people that are oppressing you. You need to be minded, like-minded with Jesus and look out for the poor because those are the ones who truly need the church. The church was never meant to be a place that felt exclusive based on wealth or status. It was meant to be a place where those who felt oppressed by the world would be accepted unconditionally. This type of community may seem difficult, but it's not impossible. I mean, yes, we have our egos. Yes, we have our personal prejudices that sadly come to the surface quite a bit. And we may unknowingly discriminate against people or, or turn people away. It may even not even be anything we say or do, but just a feeling that we give off in the church. But I remember the story that I heard from one of my seminary professors, and I've probably shared this story before, but it fits really well here. And it's from one of my seminary professors, a gentleman named uh, Peter Weaver, who was the bishop in uh, various areas of the Northeast for many years. And he was my, by far my favorite seminary professor. And he would tell these wonderful stories during class about his years in ministry. And one story he shares about when he was kind of early on in his ministry and he was serving at a church in downtown Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So he had this monstrous building right in the middle of a wealthy business district. And many of his congregation were executives for the steel companies. They were executives for the local banks. Some had old money that they inherited over the years. He had quite a few millionaires in his congregation. And they had this massive seven story building. So one night he's leaving the church and he goes out and he's locking up this building and he looks across the street 
and there sits a homeless woman in the doorway of an of a of another building and he looks up at this massive seven story structure and thinks can't we do something can't we find a way to serve the poor with this building so he talked with the church and they came up with the idea to take this one level that had been not used in quite some time in fact it was a bowling alley at one point and they decided to make this level a homeless shelter so they fixed it up they put in cots they put in showers and bathrooms and everything that these people would need and the idea was that they weren't just going to be offering a place to live for these people that they wanted these people to live or to be a part of the worshiping community so at first you have all these wealthy individuals on one side and on the other side all these homeless people who again not dressed very well probably didn't smell the greatest not the greatest manners or hygiene and bishop weaver was trying to get across that this was something they need to do as a church and there was a big controversy after worship one day because one of the women from the homeless shelter uh found out she was incontinent and she had uh soiled the pew cushions and you know this obviously didn't sit well with a lot of the more traditional members the wealthy members of the church but then one day the matriarch of the church went up to bishop weaver and said I know we're doing the right thing, but we need to do something to make this work. So they worked with the people and helped address some of their health concerns, helped address their cleanliness, you know, provided them the opportunity to be able to feel better about themselves by having a place where they can shower and could take care of themselves a little better. And they found themselves as part of the congregation. And I remember Bishop Weaver, actually, I think he was crying when he shared this part of the story, seeing this matriarch of the church who was in her 90s at the time, sitting next to a homeless woman in worship together. And I truly believe that is the vision that God has for the church, that despite of our background, our social status, we can be that one community because all those things that separate us in this world, money, uh, even things such as skin color, gender, race, nationality, any of those things that we use to segregate us here, God doesn't see those things. God sees us as one. God just sees his children when he looks at us. And that is what the church needs to be. It needs to be that community where all, regardless of who they are born to be, are welcome. I truly believe that God blesses communities that live into this image, but it takes work to do that. And it has to be work done for the right reasons. I, there's another church that um, I'm, I think I've also shared this story before, but again, it fits very well. Um, I'm, there's a pastor I know out in the Buffalo area who's serving a church in downtown Buffalo that is an incredibly poor area. Um, she has shared with me just how poor it is. I've, I've met a couple of youth who go to the church in that area, and it's a rough neighborhood. And this church, they don't have anything. But they find a way multiple times per week to provide meals to the community, like 200 at a time. And I ran into this pastor at a, at a district event about a year ago, and I asked her how things were going, and she just glowed. And she said, we're ama God is good, amazing things are happening. I don't know if we can pay my salary next month, but... We're feeding a lot of people in need. And you could see she just glowed with knowing that her church was doing the right things. And the reason that they're able to make it work is because there are many wealthier churches in the area that are working together with them to feed these people and to make sure they are taken care of. It takes putting egos aside to make this work and acknowledging that what is important to us is more often than not not important to God. What matters most to God is that we see each other through the same eyes as God sees us. That we recognize that what gives us worth in this world is not what gives us worth in God's kingdom. Our worth is not defined by status or wealth. It's defined by being, just being, a child of God. Now let us pray. Lord of the dance of life, you have breathed into us your creative, joyful spirit. You have lifted us from the dust into the swirling joy of your presence. 
We are so grateful for all that you have done for us. Each day reminds us in many ways of your mercy and your love. Yet there are times in our lives when we have felt lost and alone. We have been hurt and frightened and wondered where you were. Remind us again of your loving presence. Place your hands of healing on our lives. Comfort us when we become afraid, lost, lonely, and fearful. Prepare us to serve you faithfully all our days. As we have lifted the name of dear ones to you who are in need of your healing love, cause us to reflect on our needs for your love and our response is dedicated service to you. Be with us now in this time and place and in all the places and times of our lives. For it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Show the cash. 
Be not dismayed, whatever befalls you. You are more valuable than sparrows, and not one of them falls to the ground without the Lord knowing. Do not fear, nor be afraid. Only acknowledge the Christ in word and deed, and you will find yourself in the presence of God. Amen.